and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar Podcast. I'm Clayton. I'm Beth. I'm Lenina. Katie. And before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. Today's topic, we are going to be talking about using the real world in your game, either adapting stuff that has happened in the real world or in some way carrying over something from the real world into your games. Nina, since this was a topic you brought up as a for us to discuss, I'll give you the floor to go first. Well, I brought this up because I find it really interesting to use like the world around us and then change it to the way that we like, considering that the entire world has so many good like backboards to just spring off of and create like a new story. I think it's a really good thing to talk about. One of the few times that I considered GMing, I wanted to run a dice game based off of the Devil's Kettle over in Wisconsin, because it was really interesting, it was mysterious, it was really good to work with, because nobody could figure out why it was the way it was. So the idea was to send a group there with their guide, and then, this is a little bit of a spoiler if you ever wanted to play this game with me, which is probably never going to happen, and that we would go in to explore why people were disappearing, why new young um, Sin Eaters were being absorbed into this devil's kettle, so to speak, and it would transport you to the underworld. And then you'd have to battle through levels of different rings of uh, the underworld, if I remember well enough. Um, like a Dante type setup. You mean? Yeah. And in the end, you'd have to, like, you can't get out once you're in the underworld, from what I remember. The, you have to find a, an Averian. Yeah, so. you have to really fight your way, and your guide would end up stabbing you in the back, and sacrificing you was the goal to get more power. But the hope was in the end that the players wouldn't all die. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's pretty cutthroat for your first game. <laughs> I was really invested. Was I was like, yeah, ready to just really awesome. send everybody to their death, but it was a lot more than a first-time GM was ready to take on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what made you pick Devil's Kettle, and why did you think that'd be good for the World of Darkness geist system? Um, mainly because I read about the Avernian Gates and the fact that they just kind of appear in the world, if I remember well enough. Um, it's been a while since I've read the Geist rule book, and I felt that since it was, this was a real-world example, and we didn't have, like, a real-world explanation explanation on where it went, obviously it leads you to the underworld. <laughs> um, <laughs> and do you have any more? Because I've never actually heard of the Devil's Cattle. Like, do you have any more kind of a, like, um, what are you talking about when you say they, didn't, they don't know where it went? The Devil's Kettle is, like, a giant pitfall of water, and it's, like... If you've seen a waterfall, it's like that, but into, like, a, an unknown location. Like, it just kind of goes down, and they haven't really been able to find oh, out where okay. it comes out. And any type of, like, cameras or dye or wood or any object that they would put in there would just never come back. They would never see it again, or mm-hmm. it went so far upstream that they couldn't find it. And if you didn't know, they eventually ended up actually finding out where it went, and it was right out next to it. In the river. (laughs) Oops. They measured the water going in and measured the water going out, and the difference was just within the um, range. What's the range? It was within the margin of error. That's it, yeah. The margin of error of, like, this is most likely where it's going. They're going to dump in, I think, a couple gallons of dye, if I remember correctly, to make, to, like, really confirm this theory but they found that everything that they were just kind of throwing in there to see where it came out was just being completely obliterated. Just pulverized in the rocks Mm -hmm. where it was crashing down and everything. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of scary when you think about the fact that there may have been people that ended up down there on accident. Because I know that that happened once or twice. I'm sure people would commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And they never found, you know, the bodies. But that force of water is just insane. But it was a good, like, starting location of, like, wow, if they can't explain it, then obviously you can come up with, like, a fictional reason of why it does what it does. Mm -hmm. Because um, when science can't explain it, what can? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a really good starting base. Eventually, 
I think I could have come up with a really good, like, plot point. I just can't world build well enough to create the underworld and dungeons and dungeons on dungeons to really follow through with the game, especially with how thick the Geist rulebook is. Mm -hmm. Not Eclipse Phase level of thick, but certainly up there. It's just weirdly complex in regards of character building as well. But I think it would be a lot of fun, especially with real-world examples, because when you ran the Geist game, wasn't it based off of um, a real-world location? Yes, uh, I also ran a Geist game. Should we talk a little bit about Geist for people that don't know really quick, or... Go ahead and give a brief synopsis. A brief synopsis of Geist, uh, if we haven't covered it on the podcast before, is that it's a World of Darkness system, you use a D10, and you're essentially a human being who had a brush with death, and they died... But they were given this second chance to come back and fix sort of any mistakes or things left undone. Uh, But in return, you get this sort of powerful ghost inside your head called a geist. And it can be anything from, you know, something that wants you to commit mass murder to, you know, something that's just wanting you to go collect dead bugs. And you're not sure why, just that's what it wants you to do for whatever reason. And so, you know, it... you pierce the veil, you can, like, see ghosts, and you have powers and such. But anyway, um, that's the general concept. I ran a game of Geist set in France in the Paris Catacombs, and it was a similar sort of setup to Nina's game, in that there was an Avernian gate that opened up down there, and uh, the crew, which is actually a term in Geist for your player character group, oddly enough, spelled K-R-E-W-E, Ew. who knows yeah. why, um, was would have to go down there and sort things out. And I had picked that because the Paris catacombs are so, like, vastly uncharted. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there was a video that came out a couple years back of, of a guy, a urban explorer who was exploring down there that got lost and, and presumably died in the depths of the catacombs. I had someone had showed me that video, and I immediately had to look up everything I could, and it really thought it'd be a really cool, like, geist game idea. Obviously, right now we're using horror examples, right? So, like, you see something spooky or a location's kind of spooky, and you want to set a game there. Yeah, horror is definitely the easiest way to go, because with one exception, every game that I have run in the modern day, I've used real-world places. And you can go to Google and search, or scariest places in... And then just wherever, whatever location you want, or haunted places in, insert place here, and you will be guaranteed to come up with some hits. Like where we live in Ohio, there are um, there are websites, there are um, local books in our bookstores. There's all sorts of books in the library, and I at a bookstore I found a map of just haunted places in Ohio of. A map of Ohio and everything where something either cryptid or paranormal or relating to aliens is charted on this map as far as things that have been documented, newspaper reports, or just urban legends. It's like um, the whole map is blue and that's the area that's haunted. <laughs> yes. It's honestly the most useful map. Because... <laughs> and whenever I personally run games, I use the motto that... Um, Ra's al Ghul used in Batman Begins, always mind your surroundings. In my day-to-day life, I just, I have an eye for keeping in mind things that look cool, places that I've been that kind of spark some um, inspiration in me. Beth can attest, everywhere I go that I see a free map, (laughs) I pick up that map. Well, um, he wrote to, he sent in a request for a map. You're supposed to be able to request, like, free maps for states. So, like, yep. what was it, the five states that border Ohio or something? And he only got one back. Like, everybody <laughs> else just ignored him. They were like, what do you need a map for? Who, Use your who GPS. sent you the map, out of curiosity? It was West Virginia. Wow. Yeah. Wild and wonderful West Virginia. Yeah. The Mountaineers <laughs> coming through. <laughs> and that map is the map that I used in... No, you guys weren't with a group yet. Um, I used that map in a an Apocalyptia game where um, the player characters discovered this map amongst um, the remains of some bad guys that they had killed. And this map had all sorts of caches on it of like weapons and other things. And it also had the bad guys um, 
uh, tactical plans for how they were getting ready to assault their main base. Hmm. Oh, so, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's an example of like you taking a map and, and using yep. it in the game. I marked the map all up. I put a couple of other settlements that they hadn't discovered yet on there. Not all, not all of them were still standing by the time they got there. <laughs> but um, anything that is a physical representation of the real world that you can give people as a prop, I highly recommend it. You can find maps for free so many different places. Rest stops. Um, hotels often have maps of like local um, tourist locations or places that you can go. Like state parks, they'll have maps of the area. I got my map for free at the BMV of our state of Ohio with all the roads and everything. County fairs usually have a booth set up for the like local chamber of commerce. They might have a, um, a map of different businesses that are in the area, or it might be like a topographical map of just the, the area. You can also get, like, if you want to pay a little bit of money, you can go to, the, like, city planning and get blueprints of actual buildings because all of those blueprints are um, part of public record. You can go and get the blueprints for any building that you've got. Um, you'll have to pay a nominal fee. Hmm. But all that stuff is free or very cheap. That if you're willing to look at it, look for it, you can find it. That's pretty cool. And going back to just... Me saying every game I've run, except one, has been set in the real world. I'm pretty sure every single game has involved our the town we are currently in, which is Athens, Ohio. Athens, Ohio has very rich history. Everywhere has really rich history, if you just want to go look it up. Somebody has done a local history book, and it is available at the library to go read. Definitely the first game I ever ran that was a modern game was a horror game. It was um, the D20 version of Call of Cthulhu, and I had set it here in our home, here in our town where we were attending college, and there were a few very interesting things going on just locally at the time that I wanted to pull directly into our game, one of which was um, the university had very, very recently purchased the Ridges, which um, is the old um, asylum uh, just outside of, or just on the other side of the river from Athens, and... OU had just started renovating. They had just purchased and began renovating the Athena huh. movie, well, theater, and it was <laughs> later converted into a movie theater. And then, when after OU bought it, they converted it into it into multi screen theater. I set the majority of our first adventure in the Athena itself, where um, I kind of changed a little bit of the history because the the theater itself had been built nineteen twenties. Like I, I don't remember. So I was able to kind of pull in some um, some local history about um, about like bootlegging and um, Ohio University um, people who had some sort of connection to like occult things such as um, oh, like remote viewing and um, talking to the dead. Like the oh, like, like seances, me, like yeah, like seances and mediums and like um like local uh like Hellfire Club type, like not the comic book version of Hellfire Club, like the original version of Hellfire Club. There was right. something akin to that in Athens, and so I really pulled that history into this session that we were playing, and then I get got to um put real world people populating the town. <laughs> mm-hmm. And That's it worked really well, like, for me and my brother especially as, like, relatively new players, because you you come into it knowing more of the kind of places you can go and the kind of stuff you can do, because you're like, all right, you know, I live here. Like, this is, you know, you already know what the area is like for the most part. You know that there are probably going to be some things changed for the story, but it gives you more of a grasp of what you can do. And it really cuts out on conversations, on certain types of conversations you might have with certain types of players of... So- well, it's going to take you 10 minutes to get there. What do you mean it's going to take me 10 minutes to get there? Think about it. How long does it take you to walk from here to there? Oh. Because okay. <laughs> we had a player who liked to... <laughs> Argue liked, about everything. Yeah. <laughs> and it shuts down that argument really quickly if you can say... If you can point to real world things and mm-hmm. say, you tell me how long it realistically <laughs> takes for you to drive from here to Lake Snowden, which is a few miles outside of Athens. Mm-hmm. Um, something I've 
when I would use a real world location is I ask myself a question about like, what here interests me? So for the catacombs, it was that video, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in the video, uh, the guy is running, he's looking behind him, no one knows there's nothing there, and eventually he just drops the camera completely in pure terror and, and flees, and presumably to his death. I remember thinking, man, wh what was he running from? And like, what, what could be down there in a fantasy or horror universe to make someone act that way? Which is really what inspired me for that. And like, I think that's sort of how you have to look at certain locations if they interest you. You have to say what happened here or what is going on here that I want to know more about or explore in the game. And so like, you know, Devil's Kettle, for example, was a good one. Um, and even like Athens, you, you walk by like a shady building on your way to work and you wonder what could be going on there, you know? And it's, that's a very, that's a real world location. It's probably nothing, but mm -hmm. like for the purpose of being creative in an RPG, I think that's a good starting point for using the location. Yeah, yeah the Athena, I felt like, was a really good setting, because bef when it was originally just a one-screen theater, it was this tiny little place with, like, these kind of low ceilings, and, like, it really felt creepy <laughs> to be in there. And so Clayton had it in that game where I think there was, there was like, a cultist who was trying to summon one of the old gods or something. He was, well, he was trying to ascend to um, another plane of existence. Oh, Okay. But all I know is he did <laughs> eventually end up doing what he had intended because we flubbed, like, all of our research roles. We had no clue what was going on. We were still, like I said, <laughs> relatively new players, so we didn't know what we could do. And we ended up... And Clayton, like, he brought in something really cool with music. He had, like, a soundtrack for it. And I can never remember the name of the song you played at the very end. Carmina Barana. Okay, I can never hear that song now without imagining the little Athena theater going up in flames with, like, an old god rising out of it. Like, well, we, we screwed up so royally, <laughs> which I think is just sort of the point of Call of Cthulhu. It's very hard I to win like, Call of Cthulhu, yeah. you know? <laughs> you don't what is victory in Call of Cthulhu? <laughs> in Call of Cthulhu, victory is you survive the end and you don't go insane. Yeah, Yeah, but I mean, we might have still been alive, but like, the world was doomed at that point. It, at the very least, Athens was doomed. Like, we were not going to get out of Athens before we died. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the end of that campaign, though. We had several sessions following it. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I don't even remember that. I did Maybe the Night I... of the Living Dead one. That was in the same world. Oh, was that in yeah. the same world? I thought that was Was it separate... before the old god rose, or was it... No, no that... the, the old god did not rise. The guy was just trying to get to the other place, and he succeeded, but in up... oh, okay. Oh, okay. But in doing so, he had to sacrifice everybody in the movie theater, which, right. which he succeeded in doing. Right. Okay, wow. I just added I added that old god rising later. Maybe I added it. Well, Clayton was telling me earlier, he's like, you had nightmares after that. And I'm like, really? Because I had forgotten. So maybe I added that old god in my nightmares. <laughs> and yeah, that's Clayton, why I don't remember. Traumatic games all around. <laughs> A friend of mine ran an RPG that was like real world based and uh, here in Athens. And it was based off of us. So we were playing ourselves and Cthulhu Dark, ironically. <laughs> and... Um, it's like a up. light version of Call of Cthulhu. It uses a D6. Very, very, like a page of rules. Literally so rules light. And we were exploring different parts of campus that were inherently deemed as like possibly haunted, possibly spooky. And one of them was um, the old asylum. One of them was the bottom of the Ark building, the basement, which when you go in there, like it, you can get lost because Whoever designed a lot of the main buildings in Athens didn't do it logically. <laughs> so, like, it's turn left, turn right, and there's, like, it's a maze of different things, and the lights don't work down there. No. The steam tunnels was another one. That's right. Which is illegal, and no one's ever been in there, so. Um, but there's, like... But is it a cool idea? Because there's, like, grates all over campus where, like, you step on it, and there's lots of noise, and they're locked, and, like... There's rumors that there's spooky stuff down there, and, like, creatures can crawl and travel throughout Athens, just through the bottom of us. Like, um... Like, now, that game like got a little absurd yeah. in that by the end of the first session, we had discovered that hundreds of students had been killed in the steam tunnels, and, like, no one knew. And it was this big scandal, and the university was considering closing. And then the second session, 
hundreds more students died, so now the university had to close, and we were all just like, well, okay. Eventually, Athens kind of went up in flames, and we left the state. <laughs> it, it wasn't, but it, was, it wasn't very gradual, it was very, uh, Some. like, well, you just found 300 corpses, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, just, everything ends up on fire in Call of Cthulhu somehow. It's true. Like, our shadow people took over, and we ended up just like, well, see ya. It was a mess. Nice, nice. I uh, hope you're all having fun. We drove, to, we we drove to Florida. <laughs> just, we noped out. We were like, never mind. <laughs> we can't save this. We left, another, we left a PC behind. He just accepted his shadows. <laughs> yeah, and he just, like, gave up and joined the Cthulhu monsters. But that that's an example of, like, loosely using real world. Because, like, I, I don't know if the GM had actually ever been down... In say the steam tunnels, which again I don't know why they would because you're not allowed to be down there, but or the um, arc basement, maybe the arc basement, but they have they PC um and PC a lot, which is a term they use of exploring random buildings on campus, like oh just walking around like an NPC. The reason why it just made everything just feel actually spooky was just like oh man now I can't walk into that hallway without imagining all of these scary things happening and finding mm-hmm. my friends' dead bodies. Mm-hmm. Using your world and kind of making it, giving it a little twist just puts a little more of um, a reality spin on your game, and it makes it easier to imagine. There's less that the mind has to do, and you can focus more on your character mm-hmm. instead of trying to build the world around you as you play. And sometimes in the real world, you will see something, if you're minding your surroundings, you will see something that you were like, oh my god, I had no idea that this was a real thing. My example is from a, an Apocalyptia game where we, where all the player characters woke up in the Cleveland Clinic. And the impetus for this entire session was a picture that I had seen, or a, a scene that I had seen in the real Cleveland Clinic. And I took a picture of it for uh, use in the game where there was a door that you were required to go through to get, go through in order to reach another part of the hospital. And the sign on the door, and I will post a picture of this in the show notes, literally says, push until alarm sounds. Door can be opened in 15 seconds. That is the most video gamey thing I have <laughs> ever seen in the real world. <laughs> and oh it just God. screamed, you have to do a zombie apocalypse. Make a zombie attack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just imagine being there and zombies coming after you, it's, and you see that fucking door. <laughs> it's something in every zombie video game I have ever played. Left 4 Dead, I remember, has a big mechanic with, like, yep. sound the alarm and the horde shows up. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember oh, um, I, I, Beth and I played in that mm-hmm. uh, one, two shot, I think it was, right? Right. And I remember we hit that door and we all just looked at you and we were like, come on! <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because at that point, like, n- none of us had, I think, like, None of us had weapons or anything, so we're like, you had, we like, had scalpels spears. and... Yeah, we had, had some spears very made out of um, uh, scissors taped to uh, <laughs> ivy poles. That is amazing! <laughs> Inventive, but we're like, how, how are we going to hold off, you know, an entire horde of zombies? But. I mean, if you're in a hospital at the end of, like, during an apocalypse, that's not the worst place you could be. Oh, you we were, oh we it had is. All, it we is had the worst all place. just had surgery. We were oh, so right. certain we rolled how oh, many days we were out from surgery. Now, that's a different story. I think my character like had uh, yeah, but just but woken up you can from cut a coma or something, something, so I was just you not been like shot in the head. I was shot in the head. And I was running around you were trying to run around. Trying to run around. I was just limping with my uh, IV. <laughs> I was playing myself after the surgery I had in real life, which was to, like, for Crohn's disease, like, everything from the lower intestine, or the small intestine down was removed. And I managed to roll a flipping, like, what did I roll? A one? So it was, like, the day after surgery. Oh, and I was like, no. you got to be kidding. I was like, I literally wouldn't even be in my right mind. When I ran the X-Files game, I ran an X-Files game that was pretty long running, I ended up actually doing a more of like a combination of real world locations and like pseudo real world locations. So like a small town in Colorado that doesn't necessarily exist, but was based off of a small town that, you know, my uh, half sister lives in, in Colorado. But then I'd also have like, they, they did a lot of work in Washington, D.C. And like, I looked up a lot of stuff for that. So my question is, how do you best, is it okay to walk that line? Or if you're going to run a game, would you rather do full-on pseudo-real location? So, like, 
this is based off Washington, D.C., but it's not actually D.C., or would you do all the research and really, like, have the locations worked out exactly as they are? My style is I research the shit out of stuff. I like having the real-world grounding of knowing what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, partially because I've, I've played so many games with um, annoying players who want to contradict stuff who want to say, no, that's not how it really is. Mm. And you're like, well, I have proof now, motherfucker. (laughs) Yeah, I have a fucking picture I took with my phone here showing that that's (laughs) how it really works. Man, it always just feels like players like that just want to ruin your fun, ruin everybody else's fun by trying to just make their own bizarre um, excuse for why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. Right. They're really, they're really just playing a game by themselves. Yeah. They're they're taking an antagonistic view toward the DM, and then it's just like they they might as well just be at home writing a book or playing a one player video game because they're really just they're not interested in everybody else around the table. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the ability of whenever we're playing in a in a, in a game set in the real world, we're all sitting around like I'm thinking of Hunter. And um, you guys encounter something, and I can, I as the storyteller can say, whenever you guys say, I want to research this, I'll say, okay, you can pull out your phones and see what you can find. Oh, True. That's cool. Yeah, that is always fun. Um, because then it's just like, oh man, I'm actually doing things. I don't have to just roll a dice, I actually have to research something. Yeah, that's really cool. And I made, I based a lot of, well, I didn't have a chance because the campaign didn't run long enough, but the few monsters that you guys did experience that were, um, not statted out from World of Darkness were based on real. Th- oh yeah, uh, quote real. <laughs> like they, I would go to local I would, legend. Yeah, local legends or based on um, just like creepy pasta. Right. I I used creepy pasta a lot. Yeah. Too. Oh man, I remember that. But being able to uh, to just say to your players, well, what can you find out about? this local spirit that is unhappy and is killing people. Apparently not always a lot. (laughs) Well, let's see. Did I have you guys roll or did I just show you the page of, um, of the look of the legend of old Raritan? I think we had to roll. And if we rolled high enough, we found this site. If you rolled high enough, I told you to go, which site to go to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that's that's not a big thing outside of this area of Southern Ohio. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to just find that on a Google search, like initially, unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Right. Well, another thing, using real world locations like that and just keeping an eye out. Something else from that very same game was because I am from that area and I grew up there. I knew a a site that had nothing to do with the plot, but it was really creepy sitting outside a church, a big sign that said, the Lord is watching you. <laughs> With huge eyes. Or With they painted like globes eyes. or something. <laughs> like. And we're pretty sure we bought that sign. We <laughs> paid for that sign because we got married at that church and we sent them. We didn't have to send them any money, but we sent them $100 for letting us have it there. And they, just and, put it uh, <laughs> and they put up the sign like right after that. We're like, oh my God, I'm pretty sure we bought that sign. <laughs> oh God. I mean, that's not a bad legacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, like in the Great Gatsby, like the, the eyes of uh, TJ. I haven't read that book in a little bit. In the start of the book, it's like PJ's watching or whatever, and the big glasses, like the optometrist or whatever. Oh, yeah, I remember what you're talking about. I remember the quote. Can't pull it up, though. It's been a while since Great Gatsby was a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, I was fortunate enough in the next Files game to have players that wouldn't fight me about, like, the minute, like, the minute details. Um, so I was able to have, like, this is a town that kind of has this feel. You know, rather than this is this mm-hmm. town steaded out exactly, and I don't know. I think I think it is your audience mm-hmm. ultimately. Um, I've also been in a game, a World of Darkness game, set in Columbus, Ohio, and something that just completely dropped me out of any sort of um, verisimilitude or for the world in which it was taking part in, because the player or the storyteller had us go to the docks of Columbus, Ohio. Oh, God. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Columbus, Ohio, it is a landlocked city. 
There, there is no there rivers. is a there is a river, but this river is very shallow. It doesn't have. It's not big enough to have a dock, let alone docks. Oh my goodness. That's funny. <laughs> that's really funny. So I guess that's an example of like we're talking about that line, right? Between right. pseudo real and real, and you can't combine the two. You need to either have this is Haven, a town in Indiana that doesn't exist, but it's based off of like this town. He can't be like, okay, we're going to Indianapolis. And I'm going to have a bunch of things that don't exist in Indianapolis existing in Indianapolis that are not related to, like, you know, spooks, Mm -hmm. if it's a horror game. Then it's just, uh, like, using the name and then just moving things around. Mm -hmm. Instead of making it your own, you're just kind of pushing things around to... And it almost comes off as, like, lazy? I don't want to say lazy. It's not Mm -hmm. quite that. Uncreative? I'm not going to go too harsh on it, because I do understand where people come from mm-hmm. when they do it, where they're mm-hmm. like, wow, I don't know this city super well, and I maybe looked up the Wikipedia page, but there's this cool thing in here, I think this would be a cool backdrop for a like a, a session or a game, I want to use it, and so they just sort of populate it with other things. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. not the best thing, but I understand why people do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is a reason why Batman fights in Gotham, and not New York City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I think it's just something about the human brain, at least for me. Like, if I hear an actual place name, I expect it to be, you know, really, Accurate. like, heavily based on, on <clears throat> real life. You then want to, like, it correct with immersion, things. like you were saying. Mm-hmm. It always feels like, oh, things that you... Because then you assume that things are the same, and then the, D- the DM or GM tells you otherwise, and it's just confusing on what's real and what's not mm-hmm. anymore. And then it's harder to play, I feel like. Yeah. That's something that I try to do if I if I am going to throw in an element that is not based on the real world when so far in the campaign it has been based on the real world. I try to I try to tell the players, hey, I'm gonna change something and then I, t- I say what I've changed. If mm-hmm. especially if it's a major plot point relating to what's really going on, like a look I like an important location. Um, even if it's based on a real place, I might say I've really changed this in some way. And mm-hmm. then I'll explain how it, how you're seeing it. Yeah, I think what? it kind of has to do with how the players are are picturing everything in their minds. Because if you start out with a fictional place name, then they start out with a blank slate that you then get a build off of. But if you give them a real place name, they're going to fill in whatever information, correct or not, that they have about that place. And then trying to change that image, I think, is what messes with immersion. When you've had one image in your mind and all of a sudden it switches and it's different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of like when an author describes a character with dark hair and then they cast a blonde haired person to play that person in the movie. Yeah, I think maybe that's why some people get so really pissed off about that. Like changing that image is really difficult. And yeah, then it just feels wrong and like it's. Then you're just like frustrated with it the entire time and. It really does break your immersion. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a really good way to put it. I think the one scenario where this could work would be setting it somewhere where you as a GM maybe don't have a great idea about the actual location, but none of the players do either. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like for the Paris game, not a single person in that game had ever been to France. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't in the game. I'm thinking of, yeah. No. <laughs> anyway. She was stepped. I don't remember her being in there, but if she was, then okay, one person had been. Remember, because she kept trying to convince you that she had a motorcycle and she was an artist, and okay, one person had been to France, <laughs> but <laughs> well, now my whole well, you just undermined my whole point. But was the player familiar enough that they would be able to tell no, if you would change anything? No, not necessarily, and and so that was why it worked initially. Was well, I had done some rudimentary research, but like not a whole lot about France. I mean, I'm, I've never left the states as much as I wanted to, um, so. It worked because I could just say, I, I, the most of the game was in the catacombs, and then for the the brief amount of time where they were above ground, I was like, okay, you're at your hotel. I wasn't gonna, and I didn't give like a name or anything. I just tried to keep it as vague as possible so that like it, it you know, there is probably a hotel that's super eight or whatever in France. I'm sure that chain extends out overseas, uh, maybe a Marriott. I don't know, but uh, they're they're at a hotel, you know. So I I didn't like try to build anything 
like too intricate outside of the catacombs. Mm-hmm. I think that you just you, you can't like Columbus. You can't every pe- most people in Ohio have been to Columbus, so you can't just base a game there and then be like, you guys go to the docks. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody in Ohio knows that Columbus is landlocked. Yeah, there are no guys in Columbus. <laughs> Part of the issue was he was running a, a pre-published scenario. Mm. Oh, and tried to sell oh, that and he in like, an actual tried place. to mesh it into... Okay. Uh, uh, but still, saying the docks in Columbus. Yeah. It's like trying to say, like, the desert in Ohio. Or you know that waterfall that's right in the middle of New York City. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like then you have to, like... You can say this waterfall that is in a, a city that's very that very much reminds you of New York, but it's not New York. <laughs> yep. York New. Mm-hmm. Or um U Nork. U Nork. Good city that's name. So hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> I will never use that location. <laughs> I want to hear you try to use that location because I think it would be <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> My own, uh, my only other sort of discussion question I have is historical settings and historical locations. What is everyone's thoughts on using those in a game? Uh, I just ran a one shot for everybody the other day that was set in, you know, 1190s Palestine. So I'm not sure, you know, does that give you more of that leeway? Because a lot of things from that part area of time don't exist there currently. Um, it's, it all depends on how much I per- how much I personally know about the time period um, and the location. Like I really don't know hardly anything about what was going on then, so I was just kind of trusting that you either knew or you were making it up and mm. made it sound. But you got good, me on the Richard which, thing, by the way. Uh, I well, like looked that up after you left. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I had to look that up during the session, so okay, oh, okay. Um, it wasn't something that I just knew. I was like, damn. Clean. Oh. Impressing yeah. me with that history knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but if you if you do bring up a history thing, I'm going to do a very quick search of, of relevant terms mm-hmm. as a player. So um, I guess I'm kind of an annoying player in that aspect. I don't think I don't think so um, because I had even before I ran this one shot to run a, a longer campaign that was sort of set in this historical time period, and a lot of people weren't really sure how to act or, like, what to do because they didn't have an idea of the terminology or anything like that. Um, and it, actually, the first session before Character Gen was me giving, like, a history lesson. And, you know, not that I mind that. Like, that's what I, you know, do for a living. Mm-hmm. But, like, it, it just sort of felt like, do, do you need to do that before you have character creation in a, in a historical or a real-world game? I think you should definitely go over kind of the limits of what is based on the real world. Like... Going back to our hunter game, I said this is if you can find information about the real world, this is it is going to be used in this game. Um, I made that very clear up front, and then I, if I had to make any changes to the real world, I let you know about it at the time that I was making the changes. That's how picky I am. <laughs> Clayton is a picky, picky person. <laughs> yes, I have I have the things that I like, and I have the things that and everything else that I don't like. Which is all right. It's normal. <laughs> Is it any different from when a fantasy game starts up, you starting off before character gen and giving a brief history of the world? I don't think it's really any different. Because that was how I had rationalized it. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give a 30-minute like, little history lesson of where things are in the world right now so people know how to set their characters up, which is what I think you would do if you were you know, starting mm-hmm. people off in a fresh fantasy world they don't know anything about. I don't know if I would do 30 minutes. I... Maybe it was about 20. Kyle yeah. likes to talk about his history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I feel you. But I'll, also, I've played with enough players who just kind of, like, after three minutes, they're, they're, like, they're okay. not paying attention. Classy-eyed. I can tell. Whenever I try to get people up to speed. Um, Spark notes it. <laughs> yeah, I give, like, a 10 point, 10 bullet points. I don't, I don't even print out full paragraphs anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that um, it wasn't real world based, but the game that never happened... That was very historically like bound. Uh, where I played Avery, we made it, and it was a very long winded beginning, like pages upon pages of detailed history. Oh, right, yeah, and it was just yeah, yeah. Uh, so much to go into. Like at that point, it was like reading a rule book. Yeah, I I had tried to run a fantasy game a couple years back where I had like 
it was a summer. I my job hadn't started yet. I was sort of just had some free time, so I sat down and spent like three or four days just flushing out this expansive fantasy universe to try to have people play in. But then the issue becomes you then have like you know a twenty five page document. People are going to have to go like look and read through and. It's, it's harder for a player to go read through that and absorb the information rather than you, since it all sprang, like, mm-hmm. sprang from your, your head. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess, yeah, yeah that was kind of similar in that aspect, too. Where sometimes, like, even if it is a real-world-based example, if you know so much more than the players, sometimes you need to, like, let them figure it out versus, like, like exploring a different country. If you've been there and you've seen it, or even a different state, and they haven't, like, act like it's your first time going there and try to explore your, like, walkthrough of, like, man, I've never been to this city before. What's the first thing that somebody would do that never been in this city? You would look for a map. I think that depends on the player type, too. Because, you know, I, I have that game that I play in where I came in and it was on its fourth incarnation. And there was four games in this, there was this huge universe I had to, like, wrap my mind around and it took me, like half the game to finally start to understand a little bit of what all was going on, but I, I don't know quite how... I think I think it depends on the player, because there are some players that love that kind of stuff. They're yeah. just like, give me all this information, I'll remember it, I'll absorb this lore, I, I want to be able to act as in-character as possible. Mm-hmm. But other people are kind of just like, like, I just want to play the game, and like, yeah. I'll still act in-character, but I'll figure it out as I go along, rather than, you know, getting a history lesson mm-hmm. of, of a real world or a fake world before I start, so... And that's that's an interesting sort of player dynamic, like, player archetype divide. I think so, too. But don't write 25 pages. Yeah. (laughs) You'll get people, like... I had a timeline. Like, it was was very intricate and, like, overblown. It was more of us playing um, a game you wrote. Less of, like, a game you designed and more of, like, us. We're following the It was like I made a universe and I was like, now everyone run around in my universe, which... Which... Can which can be a thing that happens, but usually not overnight. The, the universe needs to be built by the players and the GM, like concurrently, like a man. Mm-hmm. You know, and exactly. that's a great example actually, because because we all were there for character gener- like world generation. Mm-hmm. We all knew everything about the, like the stuff, and yes, we may have we may have forgotten a few races. <laughs> <laughs> those don't count. We don't talk about those. But um, <laughs> but like we all knew. I mean. Sure, one player in particular might know more about their races. Like, I might know more about the Vikinger, but you know more about the Celians. I mean, I'm sure people forget yeah. the fact that we have a fountain, so... So there you go. But, like, but everybody knows the core tenets of the world. We're on a huge tangent right now, I realize, but... <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about, like, vers- like walking into a world that somebody that a GM built from scratch versus creating the world with your players... And, like, sure, you, you can get that level of lore, but it needs to be built up over, like, a game or two rather than, you know, like I did with that one example of the game that didn't really happen, writing 25 pages of background and character lore, universe lore, and then just, you know, having players, like, have to dunk their head in and figure it out on their own. Mm-hmm. Versus Abena, where we all just built the world from the ground up together as a group. In that type of situation, I try to either... The player characters are from this place, and so I have to do an info dump as to kind of catch them up to speed as to what's going on in the area. Or, for some reason, either something I've come up with or something that I put on the players to come up with during character creation, they start out in a place that they're, that they're new to. That way, you have the aspect of they're basically a tourist in this place. They're not really familiar with things. They're they're learning it as you're presenting it. They need to ask questions. Yes. That's a good way to go about it. But Nina, you've touched on something that I kind of want to go back to um, when we talked a little bit about the, like hospitals. Um, and you were saying that not being a bad place to be at the uh, start of the zombie apocalypse. And I, I said, I think that would, I think a hospital would be ground zero for the zombie apocalypse because all this, as people are, get sick and are dying, they're going to be rushed to the hospital. True. Um, that makes hospitals an awesome place to start a, a zombie apocalypse game. What are some other locations that would be really awesome to do for a specific type of game? Like some things that I have seen in the media is like, um, like, a, like an aircraft carrier mm-hmm. at the start of like, not necessarily at the very beginning, but definitely during a zombie apocalypse, because then you're kind of 
you can do your own thing, but you've kind of got to go into real, uh, in, into inland in order to like resupply and stuff like that. So you've got a base that is secure until somebody gets infected on the ship. Uh-huh. And then, then on the ship, you've got all the bulkheads and stuff that you can kind of seal people away in and slowly but surely close off the amount of space that you have mm. access to. I think uh, a submarine is really good for that reason, too, mm. but just for, like, a one-shot. Mm-hmm. You know, oh where there's still, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's an isolated outbreak, and you're down there, there's nowhere to go, and... The claustrophobia, claustrophobia that goes along sets with, in. with just submarines in general. And then you can do, um, like, the infamous shout-out between the commanding officer and the exo yeah. who, uh, who disagree on what their orders are, a la mm-hmm. Hunt for Red October and um, Red Tide, or Crim- Crimson Tide, and pretty much every submarine movie that's ever been made. <laughs> a lot of tropes, but but a fun place to set that up, nonetheless, I feel like. I think a good place, because, like, turning things like natural disasters into, like, a living kind of creature, like being, you know, in California, and say the fault line breaks, and there you go, you're floating off into the ocean, what's going on? And I think that's a pretty bizarre thing to have. <laughs> especially because if you're, especially if you're from that area, it is the familiar, but things are fucked up, yeah. things are... Things are different. You can't predict how things are going to be different. So there is still that exploration aspect for a place you know very well. Mm-hmm. And, um, like, the base of an inactive volcano where, like, a lava monster erupts or being in, like, a very populated city and aliens invade, such as New York, because, like, that's a common trope. Mm-hmm. Aliens take over New York. I've yeah. always thought that for an alien tr- uh, invasion scenario. A cool place to set it is, uh, as much as I hate this movie, um, the M. Night Shyamalan film with Mel Gibson. All signs. Yeah. Where it's sort of in a rural area and, like, no one really knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and, and actually, some of the, uh, War of the Worlds, uh, elements in there too, because there's parts where they're definitely in a rural area. Mm-hmm. And, like, I, I kind of like this idea that you're, you know, there's not a whole lot of communication. You're sort of left to your own devices, but it is, you know, rural America, like, everybody's got a firearm, at least, so that's settled, and um, it's sort of just seeing what you can do and not knowing really a whole lot about what's going on in other parts of the state, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I like that idea a lot. I really like Dawn of the Dead, because it seems like, because being in, like, a mall seems mm-hmm. like the best case scenario at first, if you're thinking about it, like, all the supplies that are in there and everything. But then you've got, you know, the entire place, like, tons of glass. There's, like, line of sight everywhere. You know what I mean? For so many to, like, entrances see and you, exits. So many entrances and exits. Yeah. I really enjoy that. Ooh. What about, like, a, um, not a haunted house, but a fun house and being chased by... Like a really large one, like those mirror rooms and like mm-hmm. those kind of messed up trippy rooms, and trying to figure out your way to get out of there. Some sort of like it'd be horror based, um, like as just a rundown amusement park. Yeah, as, yeah. The, as yeah. the location. I feel like that's also very common. They do that in Left 4 Dead as well. The Silent of, Hill. Mm-hmm. That was a really good one. Instead of zombies, it's like somebody being. It's more of like a twist between like Left 4 Dead and Saw. What's always stuck with me back on the terms of hospitals, besides just zombies, but it's also like a slasher trope, is Halloween 2 has always stuck with me as sort of a, mm. a really formative like horror experience, where you have the skeleton crew in the hospital, because hospitals, when they're like barren but active, like I'm not talking about like an abandoned hospital, but like mm-hmm. a hospital where you there should be a lot of people, but they're not, is just already inherently creepy. And like then, a small mm-hmm. town hospital. Yeah, exactly. And then you add to that that, you know, you're being chased by something mm-hmm. in there. It, it, I think that's a really ripe atmosphere for like a horror game, like a slasher game. I feel like I noticed that a lot of these are either horror-based or fear-based, but I think that's what makes using real-world examples so important, because like you always feel like if you take like a place like your home, your hometown, a hospital where you feel safe, and you twist it to have like that aspect of fear in it, I feel like that's very, very common. Like mm-hmm. there's no reason to or there's very little reason to have a fun based happy 
type of game in a place that you know very well. You're not, I've never heard anyone be like, let's do a slice of life game <laughs> set in the real world. Oh my god. Like, I don't what's know. The, what's no. the, that doesn't feel like there's a good point. I noticed that just a lot of it is scary. <laughs> well, you can also do action, like high action games, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, emulating Lethal Weapon or some other, like, just over-the-top action movie or, or even survival. an anime. Or, yeah. yeah, something where it gives you a chance to be something that you're not more or other right than yeah. you are in real life. Mm-hmm. But I think that modern just plays so well for the horror genre for RPGs just because you can take what is known and just kind of twist it enough. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't take much twisting in order for people to really genuinely feel kind of creeped out and change the way you see that location from every time you look at it. Plus, it's, it's building on fear or familiarity that you have mm-hmm. with those locations already. That, like, if you're running a fantasy Cthulhu game, you know, you're not going to have that same elements. Because, like, oh no, the the orc village that's twisted beyond belief. That That's scary, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> that's not the same thing as that hospital down the street that everyone gets kind of creeped mm-hmm. out by. We're set, we're going there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, oh... Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Spooky. <clears throat> Mankind's first fear was the fear of unknown. And if you can make something that is familiar and show that it is unknown, it just creeps people mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. It's that, like, ever-longing mindset of humanity of, like, if you just take everything in the room and shift it like, two inches to the right, something feels wrong. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. that's a really good way to look yeah. at it on both parts. You shift any type of reality just a little just two inches to the right, everything is warped. Doesn't even like because if you change it too much, then you are out of reality. Mm-hmm. Quote yeah, unquote. it's just a different place. Mm-hmm. So you got to get that good medium between shifting and changing, mm-hmm. which I think is super cool and unique. Or as unique as you can get. Oh, I think something that I've never actually played in, but the idea of taking like a real world and just, you know, doing the honey, I shrunk the kids thing and just being shrunk down to mini size. <laughs> I think that'd be a kind of fun game. Yeah. Because then it would be exploration survival type where it's like, oh man, we're in like the front yard, but oh wow. Everything's different. Yeah. yeah. I was obsessed with that movie when I was a kid. Oh, we saw like the 4D version of it in like Disney when I was younger uh-huh. and like when like like a dog came up and I went to look you and you got sprayed with water <laughs> and I thought that was pretty nifty. Yeah, I went to Disney World when I was, like, 11, and they had the whole, like, setup where you could crawl over, like, the huge leaves and the uh, flowers and stuff. <laughs> I guess a more uh, a more specific example would be Ant-Man, of, like, the ability to shrink down and, say, breaking that. Or even, um, like, a Tron-type game where you're sucked into the video game, even if that's... Uh, there's, there's a couple more uh, movies or... I don't know if I'd ever want to play in a Tron RPG. Oh, I would. I would for sure. Those <laughs> light bikes, the little frisbee. Da- oh man, that'd be so cool. Everything would be pixelated and it'd be nifty. <laughs> One aspect of playing in the real world that we really haven't touched on yet is the law and order oh. mantra of ripped from today's headlines. Mm. Oh yeah. Okay. Even in our local newspapers, I'll still occasion I'll co- I'll occasionally find like an article that kind of sparks my interest of wanting to take on like tell some sort of a weird story along with that and it's not necessarily just something that i can play a game around but i've also gotten like inspiration for like writing stuff um but i feel like you probably like do some extra research like you read the article and not just the headline like you do you dig into it a little extra whereas like law and order seems to just kind of go oh look at this headline it's neat let's just assume we know what it means and run with that you well, know, like, I, I like that. I like your way better. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying both ways of mm-hmm. just taking what the headline says and, like, that's the gospel truth. Let's see what kind of story we can come up uh-huh. that fulfills that headline literally. Oh, yeah. That would be another good, like, using that as kind of like a monster of the week thing. Like, each week you get a new headline or something. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you could, could, the, head, the uh, headline could, like, seem mundane. But there's something going on. There's something twisted in there. Like each adventure begins with a clipping from a real newspaper. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's um, really cool. You, if you if you're running like a um, like a supernatural, like based on the TV show Supernatural style of game, 
yeah, you could very easily, um, there are news feeds that just feed you weird, weird stuff that's been in the newspapers, like across the country. And every newspaper is online now. So you could literally print out an article that feeds into whatever adventure the player characters are going to be participating in next. I think that's a really nifty idea. There's just so many different ways you could go about that. You can make it in, like, a mystery kind of sense, a horror kind of sense, a fantasy kind of sense. Like, oh, your things are disappearing from your home? Uh, or Gremlins. from your backyard? Gremlins, fairies, <laughs> instead of, like, crows taking it. <laughs> I feel Probably. like you could also get really good ideas from, what are those little blurbs called that they run in, like, the, you know, they're... they're like just little things where they talk about like this person got arrested for this weird All reason or whatever. The yeah, the plotters. 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 Like I've seen some really weird police plotters oh, that are like, yeah. what in the heck? Like you're you're tuned into, or if it's really modern day, like they have like most police stations have like a Twitter feed. Mm-hmm. Like especially um, here in Athens on Halloween, you watch that Twitter feed and you just. So mm-hmm. many things happen. <laughs> just the other day, there was a guy that um. Climbed, scaled some buildings to get away from I cops. Saw that in the yeah. <laughs> and it's just like drunk man gets away by jumping from building to building. But he left his credit card at the bar. So, whoops. <laughs> oh. I think that uh, the real world brings a lot of examples that you can use in a game. You just have to look at them and ask the right questions. Well, guys, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? All right. Yeah. <laughs> This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives License. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale. It can be found at freemusicarchive.org.